contribute to policy reform in Nigeria. Uh, part of this policy framing from learning to practice is a capstone project. My team and I are working on a prison reforms advocacy. And today we will be engaging panelists on prison reforms and national security. And this is one of the many pre NAS 27 conversations that will envision strategies to reverse Nigeria's poor economic trends to achieve high and sustained growth and bring Nigeria back on its path to assuming economic potentials. The 27th Nigeria Economic Summit with the theme securing our future, the fierce urgency of now is scheduled to hold on the 25th and 26th of October, 2021. If you haven't uh, registered, please kindly go to www.nesgroup.org forward slash 27 to pre-register now and let's have the conversations going. Uh, before I go further, I would like to do a little housekeeping uh, before we get started. All participants should kindly turn off their microphones for us to have a seamless conversation. If you have any questions during the panel discussion, please type them into the question box in your Zoom or YouTube control panel. Uh, the moderator will bring them up during the panel discussion, and then we will also have time to uh, ask questions and at the end of the presentation, a time has been allotted for that. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mr. New Yusuf, uh, Vice Chairman at the NASG for a welcome address. Mr. New Yusuf, please. Thank you, Mr. Abubakar. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Very much, sir. Sure. Go ahead. All right, thank you and then good morning, everyone. I'm glad to see that we have um, all our panelists and, and a good opinion. Yeah. Um, distinguished heads of ministries, departments and agencies, captains of industry, heads of associations, our members from the donor communities, participants at today's session, gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the board of the Nigerian Economy Summit Group, I would like to welcome our distinguished and erudite panelists and our highly esteemed participants to this October 9th, 27 pre-summit event themed prisons reforms and national security. This is one of the pre-summit events of the 27th Nigeria Economy Summit, jointly organized by the Nigeria Economy Summit Group, the NASG, and the Federal Ministry of Finance, Budget, and National Planning and is geared towards engaging stakeholders in a series of virtual conversations and working sessions in the weeks leading to the 27th Economic Summit, next 27, which in itself is scheduled to hold in the last week of October, from October 25th, Monday to October 26th, Tuesday. And if you have not registered, I kindly ask that you go to the NASG website, um, to pre-register for and to join us at the economic summit. Our registration can be two options, virtual and um, physical participation. Conversations from this series of pre-summit events will form part of the overall summit conversation for public and private sector stakeholders to explore. And of course, also conceptualize ways Nigeria can reverse the poor economic trends improve the human capital base of the economy, mitigate security challenges, and lay the necessary foundation that will lead from Nigeria into a future of high and sustained inclusive economic growth. The exponential increase in insecurity in the recent times has made a discourse on the nexus between correctional services and national security, something of great importance. This is primarily necessitated as a result of the rehabilitation and the reintegration mandate of the Nigerian Correctional Services and the principal role of this mandate in national security. The recently enacted Correctional Service Act of 2019 provides a statutory framework for reforming correctional services in line with the globally approved standard for rehabilitation and reformation of inmates. Indeed, a recent study 
shows that the correctional program provided by the national by the Nigerian Correctional Services excludes the post-release component identified in the standard minimum rules for the treatment of offenders as a significant element of inmates' reintegration upon release. So this is excluded in terms of um, the programs of the Nigerian Correctional Services. While the congestion and inmates' welfare has gained significant prominence in reform advocacy, a critical aspect of rehabilitation and formation element of the Nigerian Correctional Services mandate is the provision of adequate learning and for psychosocial development. It is on this premise that today's pre-summit event seeks to engage stakeholders to discuss the implementation of reform targets articulated in the Correctional Services Act of 2019 alongside internationally approved best practices in prison management, leading to a robust security framework. At the NASG, it is our hope that today's dialogue will help in the development of key agreements that will shape the advocacy efforts towards prison reforms, improvement of our correctional services infrastructure, and of course, national security in Nigeria. We believe that with sustained efforts from the civil society and the active collaboration with the government, we will succeed in attracting the needed consensus to drive these objectives simply in the national interest. So we look forward to a fruitful and progressive deliberation at today's pre summit event. And I look forward to having many, many of you join us for the summits between October 25th and 27th, 26th. Thank you. And I wish us a fruitful deliberation. Thank you, Mr. Thank Ibrahim. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, that was uh, Mr. Ni Yusuf, uh, Vice Chairperson, uh, Vice Chairman, uh, Board of Directors at the NASG. Thank you very much for the welcome address. Uh, before I yield the microphone to the moderator, uh, I will do my last bit uh, on the podium. Uh, I would like to introduce the moderator who will be anchoring the event for the day and also our panelists, uh, the eminent personalities that will be joining him on the conversations today. Uh, moderating the panel today uh, for prison uh, reforms and national security is uh, Mr. Zil Akaraway, his CEO at Grema Black Advisory. Uh, he will be moderating the event with pleasure today. And joining him on the panel, uh, eminent personalities, we have um, uh, the Deputy Controller General of Correction Services in Nigeria, uh, Mr. Nwakuche Sylvester, MNI. He joined the Nigerian Correctional Services in 1990 upon his graduation from the University of Calabar as an assistant pretendant in the, pre, uh, in the prisons, now Correctional Services. Uh, he holds an MSc degree in political science with specialization in international relations. He rose through the ranks to the position of DCG in the year 2020. He has worked in various custodial facilities and held sensitive positions uh, across the command of the Nigerian Correctional Services. Uh, before Mr. President uh, appointed him to the enviable position of DCG, he was an ACG in charge of training and staff development. Uh, Nwakuche Sylvester is a member of several reputable organizations, including the prestigious uh, National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies. Uh, he's married with children and enjoys swimming and soccer. Uh, he will be standing in for the Controller General of the Nigerian Correctional Services. Uh, and the second person on the panel list today uh, is no other than his household name, Rear Admiral uh, Olushegun Egbedina, retired. Uh, but not tired, as Nigerians would say. Uh, he is uh, a retired rear admiral who rose, uh, whose interests uh, after a distinguished naval career resides with issues of safety and environmental management and compliance. Uh, he is vice cha chairman of Restep Concepts Limited, a business support enterprise seeking to, crave, uh, to carve a niche in the facility management sector in Nigeria. He's a fellow of the uh, Nigerian Institute of Management, Chartered, and also a member of the Institute of International Affairs and, and the Institute of Directors of Nigeria. Uh, he's married and uh, with children. 
He enjoys swimming and meeting people and photography. Today, we'll be uh, happy to have him uh, meet new people and then share his insights with us. Uh, still on the panelists, uh, we have Dr. Shaibu M. Belgore, uh, who is the Permanent Secretary Ministry of Interior, joining us from the public sector side. Uh, he's a physician epidemiologist with bias in health administration and policy and financing. Prior to his appointment, as uh, he was uh, the NCDC COVID-19 team lead in Kwara State. Uh, he backed his first degree in medicine from the prestigious University of Maiduguri, my own uh, university too. Uh, he also has a master's degree in public health from the University of Oklahoma. Uh, we'll be pleased to have him to share perspective from the public sector side. And then uh, the lady on the panelists uh, list, is uh, Ms. Ade Salami Joke. Uh, she is the founder and executive director of the Center for Legal Support and Image Rehabilitation. Uh, you would agree with me that uh, uh, that's uh, a, a round peg in a round hole to bring to this panel. Uh, she's a criminal defense attorney with over nine years of experience. Her passion for criminal justice reform developed while working with the Legal Defense and Assistance Project, LEDAP where she had the opportunity to represent over 100 accused persons and victims of human rights violence. Ade Salami's passion for criminal practice and her the position to head several projects on criminal justice. In 2018, she served as the project manager of the Nigerian Coalition for the International Criminal Court and the African Network for International Criminal Justice. She's also a 2018 fellow of the Cornwall Center on the death penalty worldwide uh, in New York. Uh, would, it's a pleasure to welcome Ms. Joke on the panel. Uh, yes, uh, this will be the panelists for today. Uh, please uh, stay tuned as I will now yield the microphone to Mr. Zil to take over from me. Uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, I wish us free football uh, discussions. Thank you, Mr. Zil. I will yield the microphone now to you with pleasure. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. And thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. So we will be going straight into the panel discussion. Um, everybody has been introduced. Uh, but just for some context, the, this discussion is, this, is, is going to focus mainly on not just prison reform, but specifically on prisoner rehabilitation, all the efforts and plans and programs around prisoner rehabilitation, especially as it impacts national security. And that's why we have the spread of the panelists we have. So what I would like to do is to give each panelist two minutes uh, to give us context on their perspective regarding the prisoner reform, prison reform, and as it affects national security. And Etiquette will start with Ms. Uh, Joke Aladesimi. Joke? Um, uh, sir, sorry, uh, Mr. Zil. Yes. Hello? Yes, right. Mr. Zil. Uh, or, or, okay. Um, yeah, it, it's just a, a little glitch because I would, uh, would want to take the uh, keynote address from the representative of the controller general, uh, controller ah, general okay. of, the, yes, of the prisons. I mean, correctional okay. services, yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zil, the moderator. Uh, we would uh, want to invite uh, to take the podium now, uh, the representative of the Controller General of Correctional Services, uh, Mr. Sylvester Nwakuche, uh, who is in charge of non-custodial services at the uh, Nigerian Correctional Services uh, to give a keynote address uh, as we go into the program proper. Uh, Mr. Sylvester Wakuche, please. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, um, the Vice Chairman of um, the Board of Nigerian Economic Summit Group, Mr. Nii, heads of um, agencies here present. Please permit me to align myself with the protocol that has already been properly established. Um, like earlier introduced and properly done, my name is Nwakuche Sylvester MNI. 
I'm a Deputy Controller General of Corrections in charge non-custodial. I'm here standing in for the Controller General of Corrections, Hale Runab of MLI, who would have loved to be here personally, uh, but for other equally important schedules. So he has asked me to stand in his stead. I read his keynote address and a brief version, actually, um, on the occasion of the 27 Nigeria Economic Summit, pre-summit event on prison reforms and national security. I'm very delighted and feel honored to be invited to give the keynote address in this auspicious occasion. I wish to first commend you for your choice of topic. For me, this topic illustrates vividly the reason there for the question people are asking now in terms of why we still, why still do we have prisons? For those who ask these questions, I can see their concern arising from what they perceive as the inability of the prisons to perform its statutory functions of crime control and prevention in society. This, of course, is understandable, given that of late, many criminals caught by the police have said they left the prison just a while earlier. This tends to create the impression that the prison in Nigeria has become a kind of school that produces hardened and unrepentant criminals. I believe it's this kind of view that makes it easy for people to conclude that the prison is not living up to expectation. Well, let's look at the criminal justice system. The Nigerian Correctional Service, as an integral part of the Nigerian criminal justice system, plays a crucial role in the provision and maintenance of eternal peace and security through crime prevention and control in the country. The criminal justice system has a role to play within the national security construct. It has the responsibility of preventing and con controlling the spread of crimes, maintaining law and order, ensuring that those who break the laws are dealt with according to law, preserving social stability by positively dealing with offenders. When you think of the above responsibilities, what comes to mind are the police, the courts, and the prisons, now custodial correctional centers. These constitute the basic components of criminal justice system. Um, I wouldn't want to, for lack of time, because I understand I just have 10 uh, minutes to do an overview of um, this topic. I want to remind us this morning that the emergence of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act is certainly one of the best things that have happened to the Nigerian society and the justice sector. May I state here in unequivocal terms that the transition from the Nigerian Prison Service to the Nigerian Correctional Service is fundamental, far beyond a mere change in nomenclature, and Nigeria will be a lot better for it. The new law, the Act of 2019, apart from change of name from the Nigerian Prison Service to Nigerian Correctional Service, also clarifies and classifies the service into two broad parts, the custodial service and the non-custodial service. I'll briefly run through the custodial service. Uh, the following are the fundamental changes that came as a result of the promulgation of this act. First, the appointment of the Controller General of Corrections um, in section three, subsection one and two clearly describes the criteria for appointing the Controller General, including the expected qualifications. Why section two spells out the functions of the CG. Number two is the functions of the custodial facilities. It's significant to mention that the old law only prescribe custody of legal intent persons without any reformation or rehabilitation procedure being put in place. But under the new law, however, section 10 states the functions of the custodial services, which are as follows. Taking custody of all personally, all persons legally intent, providing safe, secure, and humane custody for inmates, conveying remand persons to and from courts in motorized formations, identifying the existence and causes of antisocial behaviors of inmates, and identifying the existence and causes of antisocial behaviors of inmates. Now conducting risk and needs assessment aimed at developing appropriate correctional treatment methods for reformation, rehabilitation, and reintegration. Implementing reform and rehabilitation programs to enhance the reintegration of inmates back into the society. Initiating behavior modification in inmates through the provision of medical, psychological, spiritual, and counseling services for all offenders, including violent extremists. Empowering through the development of educational and vocational skills, training programs, and facilitating incentives and income generation through custodial centers, farms, and industries. Administering both talent related institutions, providing support to facilitate the speedy disposal of cases of persons awaiting trial 
and performing other functions as may be required to further generate goals of the service. Now the act also uh, um, tried to address the issue of terming overcrowding. And that you can see in section 12, subsection four that say where the custodial center has exceeded its capacity, the state controller shall within a period not exceeding one week, notify the chief judge, the attorney general of the federation, prerogative of mercy committee, state criminal justice committee, and any other relevant body. Subsection seven states, upon receipt of the notification referred to in subsection four, the notified body shall within a period not exceeding three months, take necessary steps to decongest the facility if it must accept more inmates. On the issue of the death roll uh, inmates, we all know that before now, um, uh, uh, awaiting trial, in, I mean, uh, death roll inmates have lived in fear, but the new act has brought succor and hope to inmates on death row previously. Like I said earlier, this category of inmates live under pressure and suspense and mental torture of death, which the appropriate authorities will neither sign nor easily commute to life imprisonment. However, section 12, subsection two of the act now provides that where an inmate sentenced to death has exhausted all legal procedures for appeal and the period of 10 years has elapsed without the execution of the sentence, the chief judge may commute to the sentence of the dead person on, uh, inmate to life imprisonment. He also made provision for mentally challenged and underage uh, inmates. I wouldn't want, uh, have time to go through that. The act also talked about the reformation and rehabilitation of inmates, which I believe uh, most of our discourse will center on today. Of significant mention, I want to say here is section 14, subsection one and two of the act, which gives legal backing to the reformation and rehabilitation process for convicted persons in custody. This is to bring about a holistic character transformation before integrating them into the society. Note that before now, the reformatory programs and skill development in sundry vocations, including educational opportunities and totality levels, being given to inmates who are not statutory mandates, rather they were made creation of different controller generals of correction to give impetus to uh, our facilities. The issue of stigma, stigmatization is also of importance here. Yeah, you know, before when people go to prisons or come out, they um, try to address them as escorts. But subsection five of this act has also addressed this edge long uh, challenge of stigmatization as trained offenders who demonstrate high level of penitence can now be issued with a certificate by the chairman of the board on the recommendation of the CG. This enables him to engage and compete for social recognition without the toga of ex-convict. Now we talk about the official visitors to custodial facilities, it has been expanded. Then the staff welfare is also uh, captured within the act, discipline and inmate ration, the feeding of the inmates, you know, has also been tackled in session 30 subsection one and two of the Correctional Service Act, there shall be for the Correctional Service, as I read, funds appropriated for inmates feeding as provided by the government. And this feeding has to be reviewed every five years, according to economic dictates. Now, the issue of female inmates and juvenile offenders have also been aptly captured by the Act, where the Act says that we need to have separate facility for female inmates in all states of the Federation and that the correctional service shall also provide all necessary facilities to address the special needs, such as medical and nutritional needs of females, including pregnant women, nursing mothers, and babes in custody. The, non, the second part of this act is also a very interesting one that brought about the non-custodial services or the non-custodial measures. Perhaps one of the most important components of the act is section 37 that provide for the establishment of non-custodial measures as a sentencing option to address minor infractions without recourse to imprisonment. It states that the Nigerian Correctional Service and that the non Nigerian non-custodial service is responsible for the administration of non-custodial measures, including community service, probation, parole, restorative justice measures, and any other non-custodial measure assigned to the Correctional Service by a court of competent jurisdiction. This also tried to go into working on um, adoption of restorative justice as um, the controller general is empowered by law to provide a platform 
for victim offender mediation, family group conferencing, community mediation, amongst um, others. Well, on the issue of uh, the role of the Nigerian Correctional Service in national security, like I said earlier, the functions have actually been um, highlighted. Um, uh, we will also try to state here uh, that the, the reformation of our emails, what we have done so far, apart from the custodial center security, which we collaborate with other agencies to make sure that our emails are safe, we have, um, 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 how, how would I put it, procedures put in place to see how our emails are reformed. One is one of, one of them is the formal education, formal educational programs ranging from adult and non-formal education. We have the WIEC, the NACO, the NCE degree programs now in our facilities. Um, so far, we have about 5,757 enrolled for adult education programs and 3,162 of them have graduated. Without wasting your time, it is a known fact now that our inmates now graduate from our facilities. Under this current administration, more inmates have been able to actualize their dream of having university education while in incarceration. The service has sustained a fruitful partnership with the National Open University, which now has about 465 students studying different courses, such as peace studies and conflict resolution, criminology and political science, even law. 85 of these students, as we so speak, are at their postgraduate program, out of which four are for PhD degree, 25 for master's program, and 56 are for postgraduate diploma. 523 of them are for first degree. Vocational training, we all know about that. What the prisons are doing, but it may not be much. Uh, this has significantly raised the tempo of vocational skill acquisition among inmates. Um, several inmates have been discharged as proficient tradesmen in sundry vocations like welding, weaving, masonry, uh, furniture, tailoring, and barbing. Our aftercare services may not have been the best, but we're doing our best in May this year alone. Various trade tools and equipment ranging from carpentry to hairdressing, tailoring, plumbing, electrical, and welding tools were distributed to over 40 ex-offenders. The main objective is to empower inmates after their rehabilitation back into the society. It's a known fact also that the correctional services run farms and animal husbandry. Our cottage industries are also there. And we have the prison welfare. To improve the living condition of prisoners, we have also taken the following steps. We are talking about infrastructural upgrade, the logistics, we have purchased vehicles to take them to court. We have a robust healthcare, uh, of which um, a large catch of um, drugs, assorted drugs, and are distributed to our custodial facilities. Inmates uniforms and beddings are also taken care of. Um, that is not um, playing down on the impact of the Administration of Criminal Justice Act on prison reforms. They have done so very well, but some states have not yet domesticated this all important law. Um, this, uh, we know what the challenges are, what we are facing, the effect of prolonged remand, how people's minds are warped by the time they come out staying into our waiting trial facilities for 10 to 15 years. Somebody may want to ask, what are the challenges? They are numerous. They are surmountable, and some of them are doable. We have inadequate operational vehicles to take inmates to and from courts at, as at Wendu, infrastructural deficit. Some of our facilities are over 50, 60, 70 years old. But the good thing is that the, the Mr. President has approved, and actually there are ongoing prison facilities, 3,000 capacity facility in three in the siege of political zones. One of them is already at 80% completion in Janduza Kanu. One is in Karushi in F City. The next one now covering the South South is in Ogonin River State. You know? So these are things we are doing. We will talk about what is the way forward in part of our prison rehabilitation of our inmates. We are, uh, we are praying that the domestication and the implementation of the Administration of Criminal Justice at 2015 in the states should be, uh, 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 I mean, um, strengthened. The act provides for speedy trials, the act accommodates alternative to custodial sentencing, Marathon, if you look yeah. at section 437. And um, the treatment and the rehabilitation of inmates, our skill acquisition in sundry um, um, vocations, educational opportunities are there. And um, as we proceed, I, I think we'll begin to expand more of this. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for listening. Thank you very much, sir, Mr. Sylvester. 
the in charge of um, non-custodial services at the Nigeria Correctional Services for the uh, insightful keynote address. Uh, please allow me the pleasure now to yield the microphone to Mr. Zil Akaraway uh, to continue into the program. Mr. Zil, over to you. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. So I guess we'll just um, continue from where we stopped. So back to you, uh, Joke Aladesimi, to give us your own perspective. Two minutes, please, so that we stick to time on, um, on, the, on the panel discussion. And then I'll, I'll give each panelist an opportunity for that before we go into the discussion. So Ms. Joke Aladesimi. Um, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for this opportunity as well. And um, let me also say thank you to uh, Mr. Sylvester. Thank you for the detailed and insightful update as to what is happening and what the um, Nigerian Correctional Service is doing um, in the prisons. And I think I'm going, to, I'm going to pick up from a particular line you said while you're making your presentation as regards um, one of the things that the Nigerian Correctional Service has, has done for us is it has helped to um, address some of the challenges that the prison has faced over time. I mean challenges with regards to accommodation, with regards to feeding, with regards, it looks like the, the, the act is detailed in terms of analyzing, identifying the problems and touching the problems. And so my discussion today is going to, um, is going to be centered on the effectiveness of the correctional service act. You know, these provisions are there. This, um, um, the law is broad enough you know, it's broad enough, it has identified the, prob the problems, it has provided solutions to them, but how effective is the implementation of this act in the Correctional Service Act? How effective is, is, is it in the rehabilitation of the inmates? How, um, what, what, what can we say about the productivity of this act to, um, to, to the inmates generally? So that's the approach I'm going to be coming from, and I'm going to be talking about my, my own perspective with regards to the effectiveness of, um, of the Correctional Service Act and also make suggestions on how um, it can be better, um, it, 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 can be, it can be of better use. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> okay. Uh, DCG um, Wakuchi, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you expect that it's going to be a hot seat for you. I will do my best to find you as much cold water as I can, <laughs> but it's going to be <laughs> You are going to be in the spotlight almost certainly. So um, I'll let you go last since you're also a panelist, uh, but I would like to call Rear Admiral Olusegun Egbedino to give us the perspective, especially as it re relates to national security. Good morning. Participate. Good morning. Uh, this is just radio check. Now I know that uh, somebody is hearing me. Thank you. I, yes. must thank, yeah. I must thank those who had uh, addressed the matter um, based on the theme, prison reforms and national security. Um, they have eloquently made my job easy because um, I'm not going to be looking at uh, global issues again. I'm satisfied that uh, back home, we have been able to domesticate those things and I'm in agreement with uh, Ms. Jokhead Aladesomi on the poser she put. My own poser is very simple, but before I do that, I want to really identify or acknowledge that the basic rules with respect to global um, um, uh, application is well articulated by, by what uh, Mr. Makuche has said basic rules with respect to discrimination, registr registering, accommodation, feeding, medical inclusive. But more importantly, I'm concerned with uh, the issues of um, uh, the, the caution never to just superimpose globally approved standards on our local condition. My question, I will reiterate, what is the Nigerian standard, which of course we have had, and are these Nigerian approved standards uh, the ones we are willing to um, implement? That is a poser because when I look at the correctional service, I look at it like uh, inside wall, and then those of us outside, outside wall, how much 
talking about security, national security, how much of the deliverables exist in the outside world? When people now leave the inside world, the correctional service and come out, what are the um, buoyancy, the supports available to them? What exists in the outside world? Will it not you know, uh, sometimes frighten them to want to think life is better in the inside world? We must begin to interrogate these issues. What is the nature of uh, deliverables and uh, uh, well-being afforded the citizens of our country that might, you know, um, endear uh, those who are products of the professional service? And I'm happy that uh, Mr. Mwakuchi addressed the issues of uh, the dialectical issues of those who are saying we don't need prisons. Break down the walls and let government do its service to its people. Uh, a little bit extremist, but I think that is sometimes the way to go when you are analyzing issues and trying to make the societal conditions better. I would hold it there since it's two minutes and I don't want to uh, break the ceiling for time. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, will, we have time to come back to your, your deeper thoughts as the panel continues, don't worry. But I just wanted us to set a framework so that people have a context in which the, direction, the context and direction the discussion will go. So DCG Wakuchin, I know you've given the opening remarks, but just to give us the perspective on which um, you would go in this discussion. Uh, thank you so very much. Um, um, I, I think where we are going to, um, what we think, we sh how we should approach this, like Joke said, has to do with the implementation. The framework has been provided, the act is elaborate, or the implementation. Now, why am I saying the implementation? I don't want to say on this public uh, platform that government is uh, paying lip service to yeah. some of um, the provision of the act. Uh, as we so speak, an act that's been in existence since 2019, 2019, no funding, no funding has been released for the implementation of non-custodial services. And you know that the uh, implementation of non-custodial services is very key, not just to the Nigerian Correction of Services alone, but to the security of the nation. Uh, here though, you will see that people are picked from the streets uh, for just minor offenses and thrown into our custodial facilities, thereby bloating image population. And people that didn't know nothing are also at times innocently put in there. But what the act said, especially the non-custodial that provided for community service, uh, for uh, probation and restorative justice, is that these people that are minor offenders with less than three years uh, uh, sentencing don't need, to, don't need to come into the prisons. They should be given community service to go and work. So there is need to have personnel that needs to have training, that needs to have funding to make sure and to see that these things are implemented. Even the National Committee on Non-Custodial um, um, Measures, Optina has not been constituted other efforts are being made so that the, uh, Mr. President should constitute this committee. Even the national and the state committee and board, uh, um, state uh, board on parole has also not been implemented. On our own part, we've been doing our best administratively to follow these things up, but we know how it is. And we know that one day we'll get there. So it's the implementation that we, we are ready to go, but we need um, the way with that to push it. Thank you. Thank you very much, DCG Wakuche. Um, we hear you very loud and clear that you don't want to say the government is playing lip service to the whole thing. Um, but it's interesting what you said after that. So to kick off, I would like to ask, and you picked your words, and for not all of us, and I would like you to put clarification on that, not all of us will understand the difference between an inmate and a convict. And you know, you did speak about um, the whole, the act ensuring that there is no stigmatization. So could you just briefly tell us the difference between an inmate and a convict? Well, briefly, I think anybody can be an inmate, but it's not everybody that can be convict. Uh, inmates are those that um, are in our custodial facilities. Some of them have not been sentenced. Uh, remember that as an um, inmate, you could be a waiting trial person. 
And you cannot subject an awaiting trial person to any system, systematic regime or program of reform because he's um, considered innocent until, or, or unless proven guilty. An inmate can come in today in the morning and leave in the afternoon. A convict has been sentenced and he has to see out his time. Okay, thank you. Follow on from that, if you don't mind. Do you have the ratio of convicts to inmates in Nigeria? Well, um, as of today, I know that um, our population is almost about 70 something thousand inmates throughout the Federation, out of which about 66,000 are waiting trial persons. <laughs> That's, um, That's more than 90%. Over 70, almost just less than 73 70 plus percent. 73 percent. Yes. 73 yes. Of our inmate population, yes, are waiting trial persons. That's correct. Okay. Um, Joke. You've done a lot of work on the on prison reforms and getting I don't know if they're inmates or convicts now, but let's getting inmates out. What's your experience regarding this ratio? Okay, um, thank you very much. So there's a part, there's a part, part of my bio that I'm always very fast to talk about. And that's the fact that I've had the opportunity to represent over 100 accused persons. I consider it a huge opportunity because um, without that experience, I might not be able to understand what happens in that sphere. And um, having to interact with the inmates, interact with the court, the court officials, interact with the prison officials, gave me an insight as to um, the issues that are plaguing this particular sector. And I would say the, 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 the the statistics is, is quite alarming. You know, you're talking about over 70,000 persons in prison and six, over six, um, 66,000 of them on a waiting trial. You know, I, I, one of the things I, that triggered me starting the Center for Legal Support and Image Rehabilitation is because I understood that there was so much emphasis on providing legal support to the inmates. So much emphasis. When I when I mean so much emphasis, I mean the the, 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 the government is trying to um, set up a legal head. You know, um, Lagos State, for example, is coming up with different ways of ensuring that the prisons are not congested and all of that. And I told myself the same emphasis we are placing on legal support. How come we are not looking? deep enough into rehabilitation? How come we are not looking deep enough into reintegration? At the point when I wanted to start CELSA, I had, I, I had to do uh, my background checks. I visited the prisons, I, inter I, I spoke with the officials, I asked questions, and I was surprised to know that there is actually as high as 65% rate of recidivism. What that means is, as they are coming out- Sorry, say that again. There, there's, say as that high, again. there's as high as 65% rate of recidivism. 65%. Yes, 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 sir. So, um, you know, and I, I, I just asked myself a question. So what that means is that when we go to court and we speak all the English and then we, we, we advocate for these guys and they are released. And let's say, for example, we are representing 10 accused persons, you know. So six of them eventually come back to the prison. And I started asking myself a question, then we are not ready. We are, we, are, we are actually not having the right conversation if all our focus or all our energy is in providing legal support. We need to start looking in-depthly at rehabilitation, assisting these inmates to be able to start a life, live a positive and productive life post-incarceration. You know, and that's why I said the correctional service has... Can I go on? Go on, go on, go on. Yes, the correctional service has is actually broad enough, as it is very, very broad, looks into the issue of rehabilitation, identify the specific ways at which inmates can be rehabilitated. But the question is, how effective is, is this it? particular is this particular provision? You know, for okay. example, when I... Okay. okay. Sorry, we'll come back to you if you don't mind. But, Thank you. Uh, Rea Admiral Egbedino, I mean, you're the national security expert. With the ratios being thrown out that we have... 75% of inmates that have not been convicted, which means there is a good chance we have 75% of our prisons populated by people who have not been, who have not committed an offense. That's number one. Number two, with a 65% rate of recidivism, whatever the word is, I mean, those that have offended and come back again. How, what is the impact, in your opinion, of this type of ratios to national security, especially where the funding for rehabilitation has not been released? If I would just say 
very monosyllabic response, very high. But let me paint the picture. Okay. Are we, are we really surprised why in the last 15 years, our country has been in the state it is and things are not improving? We should not be surprised. If the justice system and the um, custodial uh, services are not able to be proactively responding to these figures, then what does that tell us? It tells us that there is no willingness, call it political will. If you are having in uh, 2019, you just did a name change and you know that the issue of uh, probative restorative justice needed to be funded and you're not funding it. And they say they are presenting a budget and nobody is watching the figures and ensuring that those aspects are catered for or provided. Who are we to blame? America? China? Come on. Let's be very serious with ourselves. If you're not doing well, let us be bold enough. Let us have the integrity to admit that we're not doing well. I'm, from that moment, begin to make a change. Certainly, security will not improve. And security is not just about guns. We always make that mistake. We always follow the wrong path. Why must security be only viewed in terms of guns? Send more troops, send more that. What is the quality of life of the Nigerian outside war? Speaking fellas language, yeah. let's keep it down. What is the quality of life? What does Nigerian life does it really matter? Do we really know what population is? Do we really know why it is necessary to educate them? Or we are playing, or we are just, you know, pretending to be, you know, making the books from Harvard and then come and see how to paste it somewhere in Nigeria. Look, before these people, you know, began to do that, they made their mistakes. And their forefathers did not meet an ungoverned space here when they came. What is wrong with us as Africans. We're not, everything about us is not bad. Okay. What, is, what, what, what has happened to the African extended family philanthropy? What are the products of our teacher, what are the, our teacher institutions doing in the sociology departments, psychology departments, and of course, strategy departments? What are our research institutes doing? Why are we okay. not making use of the products of their, you know, their seminar work? We just allow them to die. We allow our professors who will be you know, going abroad and they are respected, they give them Nobel Prize. And then when they okay. come here, they die. And I think I want to rest it there. I can okay. see that. <laughs> Thank you very much. You see, I, I like what you've done, uh, Red Admiral, like but, you know, because the correctional center, let me call it that, is at the end of a system value chain. All they do is to hold the end results of a society that has gone through a process. And I like the fact that you brought it home to the family unit. I wish we had the time to go deeper into that, but unfortunately it, we, we need to speak in the context of the chain from law and starting from law enforcement and ending at the correctional center. But both uh, Ms. Alade Simi, uh, DCG Wakuche and yourself have highlighted a key issue around the judiciary. Now we have the act. Now, if the act, okay, let me just give a big background, a brief background. Ms. Aladesimi mentioned that you said you've gotten about, helped about a hundred inmates through the judicial system to get, um, what's the word? Not- um, Bigger representation. Bigger, bigger representation. representation. So I have about the same number. I've gotten about a hundred people out of prison but I don't have the patience that you have to go through the legal system. So what I do is I look for convicts, people that have already been convicted of a crime, but have the option of a fine. It's far easier, faster. It takes three to four working days, pay the fine and they're out. Now, it brings out a point that um, DC Jin Wakuche raised. A lot, if not all, except one, of the people I got out of prison was convicted of either something called breach of peace, which if you're familiar with the law enforcement is basically when you round up homeless people, they have not actually committed an offense. So 
they're at midnight or at 1 a.m., people that don't have a home, they're hanging out in some roundabout or some bus stop. They have these green task force vans. They just round them up. They get taken to court. They get charged for breach of peace. Well, they will resist arrest because they don't know they have been arrested. And they get convicted with an option of fine. So more than 90% of all those have gotten out are in that category. About 10%, maybe a little more, would fall in the category of street traders. So these are people trying to make a living. They are hawking on the road. Yes, there's a law against it. They get arrested, they get dumped in prison, and then they are fined. So DCG Wankuche, you did mention that the law has a provision for um, community service. Now, if people are homeless, or as we like to say in Nigeria, hustling, trying to make a living, they are showing, a, they are already showing in the society a willingness to be a part of the society constructively. What's your opinion on the type of community service that we can give to this kind of people? And in your experience, what do you think the ratio is of these people that are currently inmates? Thank you so very much. The issue is this, for the mere fact that you want to earn a living uh, is not a prerequisite for you to break the law. The law is there to guide all our doings and everything we, um, that surrounds our livelihood. Now, the government um, in its wisdom has looked at the fact that it's not every crime that should take somebody behind the wall. Like you rightly observe, they said some of this um, crime one wants to call minor should not take somebody who has not committed any serious crime into a custodial facility as a waiting trial person to be mixed up with other awaiting trial persons that may have committed um, bigger crimes. I agree that within the prison facility or custodial facilities, we have what we call classification. Classification um, involves um, putting the people into different, different categories of um, livelihood within the correctional services. Now, the community service has become operational as a result of coming into, uh, 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 coming into law of the act, and it has helped tremendously. i give you an instance. During the COVID-19 lockup, the uh, 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 infection was going so high that the correctional services locked up the custodial facilities for fear of infection of inmates. And the judges who are knowledgeable in these uh, measures began to utilize community measures to sentence people that are not involved with very serious infractions. For instance, within that period, we had over 21,000 in FCT sentenced to community service orders. 21,000. 21,000 during in the what pandemic. Time frame? You Just can during imagine the pandemic. what, yes, during the pandemic, um, when it was so high, you can imagine what 21,000 in FCT would have done to Kuche or Suleja prisons. You What's can the imagine the number. Kuche and um, Suleja prisons, if you don't mind. Kuche prison should have, no, is not um, more than about 500 and something as a capacity, but as we so speak, they lock over 800 and something inmates. And we had 21,000 convictions in during the conviction COVID on community service. Community so service. you can see the you can see the the helpfulness of that order. Now these people were now sentenced to go do um, 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 um labor, work, clean the market is also enough uh, 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 punishment because for you to be cleaning the market if your neighbors will see you doing that. So it's it also acting as uh, something that will now check you from getting into crime. But there's something we needed to clear here. The okay. proper calculation of recidivism should not be based on convicts. Should be based on convicts, sorry, and not on awaiting trial persons. Because if somebody who, the high rate of recidivism, uh, recidivism is explained due to a high rate of awaiting trial persons, as they do not go through any reformatory regime, like I said, in custody. But the borderline is that the prisons is a reflection of the larger society. Right. I agree with you. Thank you very much, sir. I think what we should have, uh, and um, Joke, this may be work for you to do. Maybe we'll have two different ratios. A ratio of people that are entering prison for the second time. <laughs> So it's not a, then a ratio of people that have been convicted for a second time. 
I think those two ratios is what um, DCG Wakuchi is referring to. So somebody may have entered prison two or three times on awaiting trial status and come out, um, different from someone who's been convicted more than once. But also to you, Joke, um, just a question, a follow-on question. Regarding the fact that there is now a community service and that the Abuja judges reacted positively to the new act, what's your general opinion? I won't say experience. What's your opinion regarding the role the judiciary plays in decongesting prisons? Okay. Um, I would say that the, the introduction of the community service is actually one, um, is a good step in the right direction. Because um, through, through, this particular, um, through this particular strategy, it will help in reduce, just, just like what's, what's um, Mr. I'm sorry I keep saying Mr. Wakuchi. I really apologize yes, if, I'm not, yes, if I'm not addressing, if I'm not addressing you properly, sir. Yes, no, no, and just like what, it, thank you very much, sir. And just like what he has said, so you can imagine he 21,000 persons are also locked up in these prisons. So the community service is actually a very good one and um, um, a good step in the right direction, actually, to be able to address the issue of overpopulation of the prison. Because we're only talking about Koji prison. For example, Ikoyi prison, Ikoyi prison mm -hmm. has a capacity of 800 persons. But mm -hmm. right now they have over 2,500 persons. And, correct. you know, that's almost like, more than 100 percent like I don't, more than times two of the population that's supposed to be in that space so of course considering community service would really um if, if, if the judiciary can start making use of, of um making use of this particular strategy is to reduce the, the overpopulation of the prison and then um, also i also wanted to add that aside um um okay i also wanted to add that aside the the the, the community service, which is, I also wanted to, sorry, I said a community service now. One of the challenges also is um, the grouping of, of the inmates. Mr. Sylvester already said that as well. You know, when you start keeping those of, um, those of minor offenses with those who are, who, who, um, who are capital offenders and all of that, before you know what's happening, they are corrupting these ones. They are, they are, they are transferring, they are, um, they, 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 they transferring their ideas to these ones. You know, if, if, Community service would be able to separate those of minor offenses from actually getting into the prison, thereby giving room to um, addressing the real offenders that needs to be addressed. But can I quickly add some? Can I quickly say something with regards to what um, what Mr. Sylvester said? You know, he was talking about the, the system does not put in place reformatory um, reformatory solutions or reformatory approach for awaiting trial inmates. Sir, I have represented inmates who have spent 12 good years on a waiting trial. I've represented inmates 12. who have, 12, yes. I've represented inmates who have spent 15 years on a waiting trial. So if we are saying that we are only focusing on the convicted, then we might actually be, maybe this is even where the problem is coming from. Because if we are focusing on just the convicted, the conv convicted here, um, the convicted here is like 30, if we have 73, so that's like 27%. So what that means is we are, we are, we, are, we are developing our reformatory plans around 27% of the general population of the prison. I, I think that's like, the, the, that's the, what we need to start looking at. We can't I start focusing. That, I think that points out the, a, a major issue. If someone has been in prison for, even if it's one year on a waiting trial, there's a lot of, I imagine there's a lot of, emotional and psychological trauma that happens to the person. And if the person is awaiting trial and then eventually released and while in prison, it means there was no form of rehabilitation on that person. So I, I will move the question to Ray Admiral and Guedino. With these ratios you're now here, one, we have people spending years, a lot of them without ever having committed a crime, spending years in prison. We have people convicted for rather minor offenses that have and some of the fines I'm talking about when I talk about paying people's fines for them to leave. So the lowest I've seen was 10,000 naira, uh, 10,000 naira or three months in prison. I mean, in terms of national security, do you think that the judiciary needs to be pulled in a lot more? One, why should it take 10 years, 12 years in order to get justice? for a crime whose offense may be two years in prison, for argument's sake, 
You know, what do you, do you think that the issue of national security is well understood by the judiciary when you put all of these circumstances in, in place? What do you think, sir? Uh, you will agree with me that uh, in my earlier submission, I said we have a, in my country a warped understanding of security. We only see it in terms of guns. We forget the major part of the work of security, mind forming, mind forming. Before you get to be seeing guns, when you look at security, then it has collapsed. Now, um, understanding security issues, uh, from which perspective? Are you looking at it from the terms of uh, volumes that uh, West churns out or looking at security from our perspective, the African perspective of security? We are very decent people, very decent, but uh, confused in quote, invited commerce, confused because a people that have been colonized already 400 years of uh, doing that slavery has created generational mind forming. How much effort have our political leaders done or made to you know, assuage and reduce this you know, uh, condition we are talking about? We seem to be in a hurry to be like other people instead of retaining who we are that they envy from out there, then we continue to imbibe tastes that are alien to us. Those, in my opinion, constitute issues of insecurity before you have the guns. But to answer your question directly, whether judiciary seems to, no, I don't think they have a warped understanding. The issue is that politically, there is no awareness of security in the way it should be perceived, even from the point of the political class and the people, the people are confused and the confusion is, you know, multiplied when you start taking decisions, posting uh, solutions that cannot, you know, uh, be easily taken by them. How many Nigerians pay prison visits? Look at the monies you quoted, the kind of monies, 10,000. What are the voluntary organizations, NGOs doing? I know they will say they are doing to uh, 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 you know, ensure that they get their supports and issue papers, but that is just paper. The churches, the mosques, the social organizations, how much, how many of them, you know, help to remove uh, the pain by ensuring these little fines are paid? That's the question. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, it's, I'm, I'm Yes, sir, I will come to you in, in a second. Uh, there, is, there, are, there, there are two things I want to find out from you, so I was coming to you anyways. Um, I, I'm trying, I, I mean, I, I really, really love my country. And I think one of the first things we must do, and I'm very happy about the tone the panel has taken. Uh, we're not necessarily bashing the system. We're just pointing out the areas that need massive improvement. Because if you don't point them out, we can't improve. So this is Jiwa Kuchi. Um, the, the only woman I've ever gotten out of prison, um, I won't mention her name, was a couple of years ago. She had spent six months on a one-year sentence, and she had spent six months uh, for a charge of prostitution, which when I spoke to lawyers, they said they're not even aware that prostitution is a crime in Lagos, but that's a different issue. But following on from that, regarding the prisons, what exactly is the, is there any arrangement or what is the arrangement for women in prison that are pregnant or have their babies in prison? And also, is there any uh, trauma or psychological or psychiatry assistance for the psychological trauma of inmates? Thank you so very much, Zair. I, uh, I just want to uh, react briefly to what my sister Joker okay. said. Um, can you hear me? You're very well, loud and clear. Okay, I, I just wanted to uh, react briefly to what my sister said about um, awaiting trial persons and um, reformatory regimes. Uh, actually, what I meant by that is that statutorily, statutorily, people who are on awaiting trials are not exposed to 
treatment regimes because they are proven, um, they are seen as being innocent except proven guilty. Now, if somebody comes into a facility in the morning on a waiting trial, he can leave in the evening. So these are not people you subject to trainings like welding, tailoring, and masonry and others. It is meant for convicts who have so, so, so number of terms to serve. But we have an internal arrangement at their own approval. You cannot force an awaiting trial person to go learn any skill. He has to show interest and say, I want to learn. Because if you do that without his approval, you are infringing on his own rights. Prisoners also do have rights. So that's what I meant by saying that awaiting trial persons are not um, to go through reformatory regime. Some of the people were already trained are awaiting trial persons because they show some willingness. And we have seen that the number of sentences in the days or the years that stay in prison is long. We say, okay, you come learn one trade or the other to be useful. So that even if you are released tomorrow, you will not be a nuisance to the society. That's how it is. I, I think I, I made myself clear on, on that. That's very Coming back to your question about those who are mentally challenged, that was before. As at now, the new act has said that the custodial facilities should not accept people who are mentally deranged or have challenges. There are psychiatric hospitals to take them to. But for women who are pregnant, that came in with pregnancy, that's provision for them in the, uh, in the new act, or which the Nigerian Correctional Service has actually been implementing because women stay in their own facility. We have nurses, we have doctors, we have female wardens that attend to them. And they are also, I mean, subjected to every medical and uh, health uh, facility as much as they can. They also have visitation to the outside hospital facilities. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. But uh, back to the first question, if you don't mind, I need to make it not, I wasn't referring to inmates with psychiatric problems, I was referring to inmates. So, I mean, imagine you lock somebody up or somebody is sent to oh, a yeah. correctional center and he has spent a year or two and he knows he's innocent it's going to certainly have a psychological impact on him. I mean, is there any psychologist or psychological treatment or process to help people like that manage themselves and their minds? Because remember, Real Admiral, like Benjamin said, secrets is about the mind, to help them so that they can manage that yes. trauma. Yes. I, I actually, uh, 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 Zil, um, Joke, uh, um, uh, his NGO and um, teams like that, they've been working in collaboration with us. And they will sincerely say here that within the prison personnel, we have psychologists, which are employed as correctional service officers. You know, we talked about part of the functions of the correctional service about needs and risk assessment. Now, when somebody has been locked up and is actually innocent, you know, there's a psychological um, trauma a prolonged trauma that comes upon him. So he behoves on the Nigerian Correctional Service through the psychologists to begin to talk to them. And then these lawyers and NGOs that visit, we also rapport with them to see how they can assist these people in gaining uh, freedom, especially some of these lawyers that come on pro bono, they come and such persons are selected and given them to please handle and see how you can speedily uh, dispense of their cases. So we do have such a um, provision. It might not be enough. It might not be enough, but we have psychologists in our custodial facilities. Thank you very much. I understand we have Mr. Peter Egudo, who's representing the Ministry for Interior. That, I mean, are you here, sir? Because I think it would ease the pressure of BCG Makuche a bit. If we have, are you here, sir, Mr. Peter Egudo? Well, pending his, his, his joining, um, I, you know, talking about prisons is, is very stressful. Let me put it that way. Ah, Mr. Igbodo, thanks for joining and thanks for, yes, sir. You're still on mute. You need to unmute yourself so that we can hear you. Yes, you're still on, you need to unmute yourself. No, we still can't hear you. Hello? Yes, now we can, can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Now we can hear you, 
Uh, the PAMSEC sent greetings. Thank you very much. The Permanent Thank Secretary Minister of Interior sent his greetings. Thank you very much. We, we've received that. Thank you very Thank, much. Thank you. So, Thank uh, you. Yes, please. I don't know when you joined us and what, how much of the conversation you've heard, uh, but what we focused on is the fact that the Correctional Center is the end result of the entire judicial system, starting from law enforcement into the judiciary, and then it ends up in the Correctional Center. Of course, what enters the law enforcement has some roots in the family background and the society at large, but we're not discussing that today. So from the perspective of the Ministry of Interior, given the fact that we, the ministry sits on the Federal Executive Council, along with the Ministry of Justice that controls the judicial system, what from a ministerial perspective and a Federal Executive Council uh, perspective are we doing, considering the fact that we have almost 75% of inmates awaiting trial? I think that ratio is alarming from a human rights perspective, from a humanity, from any perspective. So what is it that the ministry is doing? And I know the ministry is not in total control, but as the minister sits on the Federal Executive Council, what's the collaboration being done to ensure that this ratio is reduced drastically and quickly? Sorry to touch you in the hot spots right away. Um, discussion. Yes, yes. Um, I want to say that uh, I'm sorry that I joined you a little late. It wasn't deliberate. And like I said, uh, the Department Secretary, Minister of uh, Interior, Dr. Belgore, sends his greetings. Um, as you have already said, the issue of correction as it is today is a concurrent issue between the federal and the federating unit. And quite very uh, coincidentally, the greater number of those that are in our facilities today are those that have state offenses. And there is the limit of which the federal government can determine how, what really happened to those cases. But there have been collaboration. I do remember at the onset of COVID in 2020, there was a collaborative arrangement through the prerogative of mercy to allow some people to enjoy their freedom based on set criteria. This was done between the federal government and the, the states. That actually helped in allowing some people, either on account of age, either on account of ill health, and such other criteria that were set for those people to enjoy their freedom. But like you say, and from the title of this discussion, what is the implication of those that are incarcerated as far as the, the security challenge that we have is concerned. Um, you are aware that some of the people that are being held, and like what my colleague from the correction has said, some of them are awaiting trial. And because they are awaiting trial, there are certain things that they are not expected to do, like the reformation program that others that have been, uh, those that have actually been sentenced, they are not uh, expected to do those. So it is the government, the policy of government that even brought about the review of the correction acts, which has now, uh, ensure that those with lesser offenses could be paroled. So that is the kind of reformation. And okay. there is the need for greater collaboration between the federal government and the states so that those that their cases could be had expeditiously should be so done. 
the burden on the federal government with regards to keeping the inmates in our facility, both in terms of security and in terms of homogeneous resources, is quite very telling. And it is equally okay. obvious that, yes. Okay. Th thank you very much. Yes, I, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Okay. I, want to, I want to, from some of the things you said, I want from a national security perspective, I would like to ask uh, first Rear Admiral Egbedino uh, and also uh, DC Jinwakuchi. Um, since 20, it was Business Day that published it uh, in May. Since 2016, we've had prison breaks in 2016, 2020 in Imo, Ondo, Edo, Kogi, Niger, Akwai, Bomenugu, Federal Capital. Total prison breaks we've had, total inmates that have escaped, uh, from what I'm seeing, is at least 3,000 yeah. to 4, 4, almost 4,000 uh, over the past couple of years. So from a national security perspective, if we, uh, what are we doing to secure prisons? Not just, and like uh, Ray Admiral, like Bedino said, security is not just about guns. The infrastructure that makes the prison environment humane, that is a lot of funding that comes federally. What are we doing to secure prisons from a humane perspective? That is to Mr. That is to the ministry. First, to you first. And this then question is directed at me. Yes, first, then they would also give out their perspective. Yes, um, with regards to uh, that, as you could see, some of the facilities that house this image were built as far back as the early 20 something or 40s. Some are so dilapidated that may not even be conducive for human habitation. Some of the structures or facilities, uh, the, yes, facilities that were used in constructing them have outlived their lives. And it is on the basis of this that the federal government has recently embarked on reconstruction or construction of befitting uh, facilities. Um, currently, 3,000 capacity facility is being constructed in three Senate, uh, geopolitical zones of the country. And that is supposed to be replicated in the three remaining geopolitical zones that will have six of that. I think, as you have said, the, uh, the resources required to undertake this is very humongous. And the resources that we have as a government continue to de uh, deplete. So that equally affects the extent to which we could go. But government is not resting on its oars as efforts are being made to improve on the facilities by way of equally introducing technology in driving the management of the activities of the inmates. So apart from the way they are being kept, Modernization in terms of ICT is equally being introduced to ease the management of image. We are quite very concerned with the recent uh, breakages that we've been having, and that too, because they fall within the realm of security, efforts is being made, committee being set to see what really has happened, why they have happened, what needs to be done to forestall and prevent that. Government is doing all about that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is your Yeah, thank you so very much, Zil. Um, you, uh, one thing we needed to also um, get the right perspective about is about this um, of what we call gel breaks. Gel breaks, um, the places you've mentioned will agree with me, are externally inclined. These are external attacks. These are not attacks that precipitated from inside the custodial, our custodial facilities. I said earlier that the prison is a reflection of the larger society. It's not only the custodial centers that are being attacked. Like um, um, Mr. Luce will say, security is not just about guns alone. Even our military facilities are being attacked. Security agencies are being attacked externally. So before they get to the prison, something had happened. 
But be that as it may, let's not go into that. What we are doing in the prisons to forestall some of these uh, attacks, like uh, Mr. Peter said, the government has also come up to build modern facilities. It may not be enough, but the six geopolitical zones are being captured for 3,000 capacity prisons, 45. We are not promising a five-star hotel status for our prisons or our custodial facilities, but something that should have humane inclination and outlook. And something that will as much as be intimidating to any aggressor from outside. Now, the new act provided that 100 meters to the prisons, there are most buffer zones, no buildings, no infrastructure, no structure should be close to that. Now, because what we have seen is that by reason of urbanization, our prisons have been uh, beclouded by buildings and uh, uh, human infrastructure. Now, there should be a relocation of such prisons to other spaces where these 100 meters from the prison should be established and should be observed. Also, the training of our personnel, very key and very important. The prison has also been empowered to carry arms, but we also needed to be trained properly in the usage of such arms. Our collaboration with the military and other security agencies, they are also known, but they also have their own problems of lack of manpower and training. So what do we do? We begin, to, we continue to improve. We continue to study things that have happened and we try to bring out strategies that will forestall future um, occurrences because actually it's embarrassing. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Rear Admiral Egbedina, for obvious reasons, I've left you last on this, talk, on this particular question. What are your thoughts? My views are that um, we need to tie up and work together. I can see this week. Who's we? The stakeholders, judiciary, legislature, okay. all the stakeholders that have business with security. Of course, that includes the citizens, um, the voluntary organizations, religious bodies, all come under the umbrella of we. Because okay. I couldn't uh, exhaustively list them. I call them, we, I just give examples. Now, what is the relationship between what we teach from school, formal education, apart from the family? Uh, what do we teach in schools with respect to social living amongst people of different religious persuasions? Do we really teach it? Uh, somebody said civics used to be part of our curriculum sometimes in the 60s, in primary school education. Along the line, we did a lot of uh, abracadabra with our educational system, 6334, 91010, just banding with uh, nomenclature and you know funny uh, combinations of names. How much of content do we put into teaching our children? ethics, how to live with people, the decent way of conducting affairs so that they can be global, they can best appeal to global best practices before global, even amongst ourselves. So that is my um, uh, intervention. Secondly, we have identified in our discourse the reasons why we have problems, the non-application of uh, the engagement in the Correctional um, service vis a vis um, co convicts, vis a vis inmates, you know, um, those awaiting trial and stuff. Are we taking it, are we making it very firm, uh, you know, engagement here or agreement that there is need to address this problem? If you know there is a problem, you address them. Don't play the ostrich and go away from them. If you know that fund is a problem, get your people to think out, think of a way to get out of the problem, not to stay with it and then give it job for the boys and begin to change names after five years. Please, I think we must hit nail on the head. And now that we have identified a problem, what are the ways out? Maybe it is looking at the ways out that maybe I believe our engagement will be fruitful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, 
Okay, we have, of course, we continue the discussion, but we have a couple of questions from the listeners and some comments. I'll take a okay. comment from Bola. Oh, no, come. Is, sorry? Tell the copper to I mean, tell the copper to uh, Bola Akinshete says the Ikoi Correctional Facility in Lagos is one that needs to be relocated. I think every, I've been to Kirikiri a few times. I, the 100 meter rule is not going to work in Ikoi or Kirikiri. Uh, nice. He says it's not conducive for fit for accommodation and that the, there has to be more collaboration with the state government. I believe Mr. Igudo had already mentioned that that there's a limit to what the federal government can do and there has to be collaboration with both NGOs, uh, to us, Real Admiral, like Brendan that said, even the churches and the state governments. So um, Aisha is asking, I imagine this question will be no, to you, no, John. No, let's do the trip. Let's do the trip. I'm aware there are several inmates who need assistance with their fines. Uh, how can we support? So if someone wants to help you, NGO, I know you deal mostly with legal representation. Um, I, I don't have the bandwidth or the patience for that. And people have even asked me if it is justice getting them out. I'm like, it may not be justice, but it's freedom. So it depends on where you want to hang. But um, Joke, what do you think? If somebody wants to assist with paying the fines, is that something your NGO would work with? Um, okay, um, thank you very much, Aisha. Um, I would say that it's actually very kind of you to have made this um, suggestion or ask this question. And I would just, I would address it in two ways, basically. If um, you can work with us, as a matter of fact, in our work uh, um, in the Center for Legal Support and Image Rehabilitation, we have worked so much with collaborations with individuals, organizations, and other CSOs as well. So of course, we can work together in making that happen. And another thing you can also do is you can go to the prison, actually. Go to the prison, talk to the officials. Are there people who are, who are um, in prison because they could not afford to pay their fines? They will be glad to help you. I've, I've, um, I've actually done, I've, I've done that in the past, actually, you know, they'll be glad to help you. So you can, either of the two options is very fine. I, I would only add the slight amendments, go to the prison office. Yeah, because they'll be able to generate a list for you, not from the prison itself. But it's nice to visit the prison. The, the, it, it, the, it, it has to be in the, in, in the correctional center, the particular correctional center, actually. It is when you go in there, they can provide you with the list. So that's where the office is. Okay, great. Uh, Kofo Majekudumi is asking that knowing the legal process that exists in the country, the prison service should discharge inmates who have been awaiting trial for more than 90 days. Uh, or rather, should we not adopt a system? Then what I think he's asking, because he says it's a gross abuse of human rights to detain people who have not been tried for an offense for the length of time that for that length of time. So I would tell you, I would, I would give my scenario, and I believe. Well, I don't know who it will be directed at because we don't have a representative from the judiciary. But I did write the Attorney General of Lagos in 2018. I, had, I got a list of about 900 inmates that had been awaiting trial. And we filtered for the number of people with their offenses. And so we had to go to their, and um, this DJ Wapuche will understand. We had to go to the individual courts to get the actual offense they committed and then check the law for the actual sentence for those offenses. And we wrote the attorney general and said, if we have people that have been awaiting trial for more than 50% of the time, if they had been found guilty, then you should either have a mass hearing or whatever and whether it is to sentence them for time served or acquit them, I don't know what the legal term would be, but um, we, we made some very, very limited progress. Mm. And if you remember, sometime in 2018, at least in Lagos, they published an inquiry and asked people to come forward with that kind of information oh. if you spent more than three years awaiting trial. And we wrote them again and said, I can give you that list. Prisons can give you that mm. list. You don't right. go to the public. Those that have spent more than three years awaiting trial on that list was for the offenses. I mean, it didn't make sense to pursue it because we only had maybe 10 yeah. people. So what Kofa, I think, is saying is, what do you think about yeah. maybe amending the law or a practice exactly. that the judiciary can enact? Can I, do you like think you need to use your, your system? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, please. 
I say you may need to mute your system. Hello. Thank you. Okay. So do you think, what do you think would work if we can enact something that says, if you've been awaiting trial for more than X percent of the sentence time, if you had been found guilty, should it be an automatic acquittal? Should it be a pardon? What do you think? Yes, Joke, and then Rear Admiral Agwedina. All right, um, thank you very much. I would say there's actually an existing law already that says that, um, yeah. yes, so they're not supposed to be remanded for that long period of time, you know, but th the question is, the laws are there, but the implementation is a problem because I've had instances where we have to keep making application for a matter to be struck out. And the, most times the court is always very reluctant um, so you have to keep making application, my Lord, can this matter, um, we, we apply for lack of diligent prosecution, can this matter be, be struck out? And we have to keep doing it over and over and over again. So the law is actually there. So it's not something that needs to be, um, it's not something that calls for an amendment. It's there, but it's just the implementation. But like you said, we don't have representation, representative of the judiciary here. So there's a limit we can say. But from my experience as a capital defense lawyer, it's actually, we make the application, we keep applying for the matter to be struck, especially when um, no weak is forthcoming but most times that takes a while and it takes years as well okay uh this is very depressing information but we had me like but you know what, what do you say i'm i'm really surprised that uh, uh civil law is practiced this way mind you people in uniform are under compact they function under civil law and military law in the custodial um application for people in uniform that is what they call the eight day report every eight days that is translated to a week there must be a report so that if the um, adjudicating body is not measuring up to its task you cannot keep people for too long even in the military you know how harsh it is if you now keep people awaiting trial for donkey years I mean, you'll you just be, you know, sitting on a keg of gunpowder. I don't know what exists in the civil environment, but there must be a way to solve this logjam. It's a problem and it must be solved. Periodically, flag officers commanding, air officers commanding, general officers commanding would have to go through the, um, you know, um, cells, I, I think monthly or so, either personally or through their agents to ensure that people don't get too uh, long in custody so that they are just, they, 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 their sentences can be passed. So I want to see similar things replicated, except lawyer here, capital punishment issues, will tell me there is such a procedure and it's been violated. If it is violated, then you should sanction the people who are violating it. That is my submission, thank you. Okay. Uh... <laughs> Thank you very much. It's um, someone also asked, does the prison, the correctional center have any, or rather what is the power the correctional center has regarding release? The, I mean, I, I imagine the law does not allow you to just open the doors and walk people out, but regarding a process to get either the judiciary involved or what does, what involvement does the correctional center have in terms of feedback of information as we're over congested or we have too many people are waiting trial what's the feedback process uh dcg wakuche this is are you there i think his system has frozen okay let me ask uh, mr Bodo, are you aware of what the feedback process is regarding um, inmates. When we have prisons that are congested or people that have, await, have been awaiting trial for too long, what's the feedback process to the judiciary to ensure that that issue gets curbed ab initio? Your system is muted, sir. You need to unmute it first. Mr. Ibodo, your system is muted. We can't hear you. Muted. Okay, great. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you we hear can me? hear you. Yes. Yes. Uh, like I said, that is yeah, an well, operation. That... Was the question directed to me? Oh, yes. Your I system think... was... So both of you would answer. 
Yeah, I think uh, Muche can answer. It's an operational issue. Okay. Yes. So, Mr. Wakuche, did you get the question? Me? me? Yes, sir. Sorry, I was just having some um, challenges. Technical there. Technical. So, I was asking what the feedback process is between the correctional release? center. Correctional center, if we have the power to release? No, no, I know you don't have the power to release. But I was saying, what's the feedback process? So as the prisons get congested or you have mechanism, this high risk, the feedback mechanism to the judiciary from the correctional center. Can somebody just um, type out the questions for me? So I'll go to um, the chat and just pick it up from there. Okay. You're yeah, asking no. about the mechanisms we have, or the feedback mechanisms we have? Into the judiciary, yes. Oh, dear. Okay, I'll type out the question. Yeah, um, but I think, uh, let's I see, I'll say... I'm so sorry. I can't seem no, no. to um, flow with you now because of network fluctuations. Uh, I, I, can, but can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you? Well, your, your network is pretty bad because you keep freezing. Okay, so um, we'll go back to... I think we're running out of time. So what I would do is, uh, Ray Admiral Egbedino, Mr. Igbodo, uh, Ms. Adlade Simi, and DCG Wakuchi. If you have closing remarks for one minute each, and then we can start to, and if you have system issues, you might want to switch off your video while you speak it. It usually helps with the bandwidth. So closing remarks, can I start with you, uh, Mr. Igodo? Hello. Hello. Yes. Um, are you there? Yes, we're here. So just one me? minute. Closing, closing yes. remarks, one minute, on how we can improve the system. What are the things we need yes. to do and be aware of? Um, this that you are doing is one of the ways we can improve the system. Stakeholders collaboration. Uh, issues of security, every one of us is a stakeholder. And we actually know the composition of those that have one thing or the other to do with regards to those that have been kept in our custody. So there is a greater need for all the stakeholders the federal government, the judiciary, the states, and other non-government actors to continue to close ranks, to see that the judicial system um, plays its own role as is expected to ensure that speedy trial is uh, guaranteed. I think that will help funding of the operations of the service is equally very important. For instance, uh, of recent, a, a complaint with regards to feeding what was initially approved as feeding allowance for inmates, Ir inflation has eroded it. That is no longer tenable. The facilities keep on, uh, the population keep on increasing, particularly with regards to what is happening with the security. And that cannot continue for long. So to me, what you have started with, these stakeholders engagement and measures that we need to put together that we are discussing is one of the ways, ways out. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, Ray Admiral Egbedino, uh, one minute closing remarks to let us on how we can improve all the things we can do to improve the system. When we are able to Thank you very much, um, Mr. Moderator. When we are able to answer some of the questions, and of course, like um, the PAMSEC Interior Ministry has said, um, I agree that talking is better than fighting. And when you talk, you broaden the space to open uh, possibilities. I think it's important to bridge the gap between judiciary and the correctional system, or even the police 
um, even in their cells, they keep too many, they keep people there for too long in total disregard of uh, statutory provisions. There must be a way the correctional uh, service must tie in with the judiciary and they must do reports like they do in the military so that they can solve this problem actionable. It's only from data that you can, and, and if it's getting too much quarterly, yearly, you can begin to systematically over a period of three to five years, you know, you know, sort out those things. Of course, why not forgetting uh, the soft application of power, not just the big, I mean, the hard way. Soft power, persuasion, the work of voluntary organizations, the churches, they should be synergized. Everything should work together. Those are my remarks. And I believe um, we shall begin to be more sincere if we uh, do those things and act on the figures or the data. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So, um, Mr. Ladesimi. Thank you very much. Um, I think I will start off by saying um, thank you to all the panelists. Um, and that's because even I've been able to learn a lot, especially from um, the, the, the um, correctional service officials. And what I've learned is actually going to be tailored into our work at Telsa and to make it a lot better. But to just had um, my concluding, um, um, my closing address, let me put it that way, I would want to emphasize on ensuring that whatever rehabilitative measures that has been put in place for the inmates are effective. And I would just quickly want to, to say this, that until we start looking at the effectiveness of the rehabilitation, whatever effort we put into it is not going to yield the desired results. If we're talking about we've given inmates the opportunity to um, write exams, to do WIAC, to do NECO, to write JAM, to attend the National Open University, we need to start asking ourselves, what are the arrangements we've placed down, which triggers to um, the inmates having having access to proper teachings, having access to professional teachings, and I'm saying this because this is one of the aspects that we have we've, 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 we've um, paid attention to in the organization. Presently, we have a virtual tutorial class that is ongoing right now for inmates of the Koyi Correctional Center for those who are um, enrolled for the GCE, and it's is because we notice that though these inmates are allowed to write exams they have to rely on themselves to be taught. So somebody who is facing a mother charge is teaching for that maths. It's, 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 it doesn't, it's unsettling for me personally. And so I just asked myself a question. There's need for us to start looking at the effectiveness of whatever measures. The prison is doing exceedingly great for them to have given access for, for, for the inmates to write exams, to learn, to learn skills. It's, it's a good, is a good step in the right direction. It's actually a very awesome idea, but we need to start looking at the effectiveness to ensure that whatever step we're taking is effective. Thank you very much, sirs. Thank you very much, and well done with all the work you're doing. Thank so, you, So, our last panelist, this is Jim Wapuche. Your seat was not as hot as I expected it to be, to be very honest. <laughs> I think you got up a bit easy. But I think your, your opening set the tone for that because you very openly highlighted the issue, so there was no point bringing them back to you. So, you are on the inside. You are the most inside person on the panel. So, in your opinion, I think, and that's what I've saved you for last, I think that your recommendations will be the most powerful because they'll be the most realistic and we would know that implementing them is where the real change sits. So if you don't mind, I will give you two minutes to tell okay, us thank, what thank are you the so very, yes. Thank what you so very much, Zale. Most, yes. yeah, thank you so very much, Zale. I apologize, I was lost. Uh, my network was bad. Uh, I had to go for alternative um, network. Like we rightly said here, there are, the law is there. Um, uh, my sister Joke said something about the law being there. It's just for us to implement these laws. And how do we implement these laws? We also need funding. Funding ties down to almost everything we want to do. Um, he, she did say something about the ECOI um, inmates that try to get some vocational educational training. But you can imagine an inmate teaching a fellow inmate. That means we need funding to employ personnel to get to that. We need to relocate some of these uh, um, facilities that have been um, overtaken by urbanization. We need to go into what we also consider e-prison. 
by going electronically, using CCTVs, jammers, and, and, and deploying technology to forestall um, external attacks. And at the same time, for the issue of rehabilitation, that's something they call halfway homes. You don't just release somebody from the prison and you throw him directly into the society. You need to at least have a place where you consider like a halfway home where the person will be gradually debriefed to quietly step into the society. Uh, it will take some time. This is just a work in progress. But I know that the legal framework has been provided. The act is in place. Um, like um, the Ray Admiral said, it's just for government to show the political will to say we are solidly behind you because for us, this is a job we want to do, and we have no, we don't know any other job, but to make sure that the correctional service, at least we should have humane face and see that anybody that steps into the prison comes out better than he went in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, uh, before I hand over to China Zamokori, just as a roundup, I think I want to commend the NESG for putting this together. And I think there's a lot of information that we don't have as the public, and there's a lot of impact. I believe there's a lot of impact as individuals we can make in the entire system, not just the correctional system, not just the judicial system, but as a nation. A nation, I tell people, a nation must be built and every individual must be involved. And for us to know where to be involved, we have to have information. And so this, panel has given us, I hope, a lot more information than we otherwise had. Now, what I also like to say is that I believe that, that a society develops as long as evolution is in the direction of human dignity. And when we look at our prisons, I, I, I'm sorry to say, but if you've ever been there, you will agree with me, we are not evolving in the direction of human dignity. We are degrading humanity by the state of our prisons. We are degrading humanity by the state of our judiciary. And that degradation of humanity is what Real Admiral Agbedina has been saying. It will impact national security negatively. It's not just boots on ground and bullets in the air. It's a whole system. So um, thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope more people will get involved with the prisons. I hope it's a pity we don't have the judiciary. And dear NESG, I would suggest we do this again with the judiciary, with law enforcement and the correctional center. And let them, I don't use the word debate, but the correctional center has feedback for them. The law enforcement, you're picking up people randomly. The judicial system cannot cope. The correctional center cannot cope. The system is busting at its seams. All of that busting, as it seems, is impacting national security. When national security is impacted, all our lives are degraded as individuals. So we need to bring all these people together. Uh, dear Mr. Igodo, I know you are presenting the PAMSEC, but the, you are the only person here who sits on the Federal Executive Council. When the Federal Executive Council meets every Wednesday, this is a topic they need to discuss. We are borrowing a lot of money as a nation. We are not funding the end result of our law enforcement process, which is the Correctional Center. It has a national security impact. So this is the information we'd like to take out from here. And I hope all of us watching, all of us listening, we now need to start engaging people we know as individuals in the correctional centers, in the judiciary, in law enforcement, in NGOs, to provide support because at the end of the day, we will all benefit from it. So thank you everyone. I will now hand over uh, to Chinazam Okorie. Thank you very much, Mr. Zil. And I'd like to say thank you to our panelists for the very informative and enlightening conversations. I mean, it couldn't have come at a better time considering the security situation in the country. Um, I think our panelists have um, beyond any reasonable doubt, um, established the direct correlation between the levels and quality of um, reformation and rehabilitation of the inmates to the levels of productivity or the, or the lack of it post reintegration into the wider society. This has serious consequences for national security. It is the thin line between 
releasing a wholesome and repentant individual into the society or creating a vicious cycle of repeat offenders who pose a significant threat to our security. So beyond the reforms in the living and sanitary conditions of the inmates, there's an all important need to also push for reforms that enhance the learning and behavioral development of these inmates. And it must be a multi-stakeholder approach. So really this pre-summit event in addition to fitting perfectly into the overall summit theme of securing the future, the fierce urgency of now, is also an initiative of the group two NESG Reset One, advocating for um, the provision of learning resources and educational materials for the um, development, for improved development opportunities of the inmates in the correctional facilities across Nigeria. So I'd like to thank you all once again for your time and your inputs. And we look forward to continuing these conversations at the 27th Nigerian Economic Summit on the 25th and 26th of this month. So thank you once again. Um, back to you, Mr. Zill. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you everybody. I think um, this brings us to the end of the panel and if there's anything else any as you want to say, please let me know. But thank you, Mr. Igbodo, for joining. Thank you, DCG Wakuche. Thank you, Re Admiral Egbedino. Thank you, Joke Aladisimi. And thank you all for the work you've been doing. Thank you for the forthrightness with which you spoke. Um, I mean, it's not very common, it's not very often you have government on one side and there are no blows thrown. But I, I like I, I love the fact that we're all being forthright. And I think. The forthrightness and the honesty is what would help us to move forward on this. So I will hand over back to NESG so that we can round up the discussion for today for 12 o'clock. So who's taking over? Ibrahim, are you still there? Is it Brian there? Who's taking over from me so that we can round up? David, are you the one taking over? All right, that's fine. Thank you so okay. much for a fantastic um, um, moderation. Thank you to all our panelists. Thank you to all our guests for joining in. Um, one final information we would like to mention as the 27th Nigeria Economic Summit approaches, on the chat box, we have the registration link. Kindly register if you are yet to register. And um, see you at NES 27. From our end here, we're signing out. Thank you, everyone, again. And do have a fantastic day. Thank All you. Best. Thank you very much. And so.